In this video, we'll try to understand how to interpret and calculate the relative risk and the associated 95% confidence interval. Suppose that we would set up a cohort study where we observe a group of smokers who are around 20 years old and that we follow these throughout their lifetime. We also follow a similar group of people who are non-smokers. For example, 10% of the smokers got lung cancer, whereas only 1% of the non-smokers got lung cancer. The lifetime risk to get lung cancer if you are a smoker is therefore estimated to 10%, whereas the corresponding risk for the non-smokers is only 1%. If we divide the risk of the smokers by the risk of the non-smokers, we see that the relative risk is 10. This means that smokers are 10 times more likely to get lung cancer compared to non-smokers. If you become a smoker, you then increase the risk to get lung cancer, which is one of the deadliest cancers, from 1% to 10%. Suppose that we have performed a similar cohort study as in the previous example. Note that this is just a fictive data set. In this example, we followed 10,000 smokers and 10,000 non-smokers. 1,000 got lung cancer out of the 10,000 smokers, whereas only 80 out of the 10,000 non-smokers got lung cancer. To calculate the risk to get lung cancer for the smokers, we divide the number of smokers with lung cancer by the total number of smokers, and do the math. We see that the smokers have a 10% risk to get lung cancer. To calculate the corresponding risk for the non-smokers, we divide the number of non-smokers with lung cancer by the total number of non-smokers, and do the math. We see that the risk to get lung cancer if you do not smoke is only 0.8%. To calculate the relative risk, we put the risk in individuals exposed to the factor, which is smoking in our example, in the numerator, and the corresponding risk for the ones that are not exposed to the factor in the denominator. We see that the relative risk is 12.5, which means that smokers are 12.5 more likely to get lung cancer compared to the non-smokers. If the relative risk is greater than 1, we know that there is an increased risk of the outcome, for example to get lung cancer, in the exposed individuals, which in our example was the smokers. If the relative risk would have been equal to 1, then the exposure has no effect on the outcome. For example, if the same proportions in the two groups would have got lung cancer, the relative risk would have been equal to 1 which would mean that smoking does not increase the risk to get lung cancer. If the relative risk is less than 1, there will be a reduced risk of the outcome in exposed individuals. Usually, one likes to test if there is a significant association between the outcome and the exposure. The null hypothesis for such a test could then be stated as the risk is the same in the two groups or that the relative risk is equal to 1. The corresponding two-sided alternative hypothesis would then say that the relative risk is different from 1. To check if our previous relative risk is significantly different from 1, we can for example compute a 95% confidence interval. To calculate the 95% confidence interval, we first begin to calculate the standard error of the logged relative risk with the following formula. We plug in the corresponding values from the table and do the math. Then we calculate the 95% confidence interval with the following formula, where this is the natural log of the relative risk, and this is the critical value from the standard normal distribution that is used to create a 95% confidence interval. The natural log of 12.5 is about 2.5257, and the standard error of the logged relative risk is 0 0.1153. Note that this is the Euler's number, 
which is approximately equal to 2.71A282. If you do the math, we see that the 95% confidence interval spans from 9.97 to 15.67. We are therefore 95% sure that the true reality risk value lies between these values. Our best estimate based on our sample is 12.5. Remember that the null hypothesis states that the reality risk is equal to 1. Since the value 1 is not included in this interval, we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the reality risk is significantly larger than 1. To compute the corresponding p-value, we can compute a simple chi-square test. The p-value from a chi-square test is in this example smaller than 0.001. Since this is smaller than the general significance level of 0.05, we can reject another hypothesis by using also the chi-square test. When using a two-sided hypothesis, the confidence interval and the p-value will result in the same conclusion about rejecting or not rejecting the null hypothesis. We will now try to understand this kind of plot that is based on a fictive data set. The plot shows the relative risk for smokers to die of any disease before they turn 70. The relative risks have been calculated for four different groups. We can see that women in Europe that smoke have an estimated relative risk value of about 2, which means that they are twice as likely to die with disease before they turn 70 compared to non-smoking women in Europe. We see that the 95% confidence interval does not include the reference line where the relative risk is equal to 1, which means that the relative risk is significantly larger than 1. In contrast, note that the interval for the Asian women includes the value 1, which means that the relative risk is not significantly different from 1. However, note that this interval is very wide, which means that the standard error is relatively large. This is generally due to relatively small sample size. Since this interval is much narrower, we are much more certain about the estimated relative risk value for this group compared to this group. This is likely due to that more European women were included in the study. For the Asian women, their relative risk value might be less than 1 or as large as 4. We should therefore be careful to draw any conclusions from relative risk values they are associated with wide confidence intervals. Finally, we will have a look at an example where we follow a number of individuals that have been infected with a certain virus. One believes that old people have a higher risk of dying of the infection compared to young people. Being old is therefore considered as a risk factor in this example. The individuals were followed for one month after they had been infected by the virus. The proportion of deaths due to the infection was then calculated. 12% of the old people died, whereas only 1% of the young people died. The relative risk is therefore 12, which means that old people are 12 times more likely to die due to the infection compared to young people. Now, Suppose that we would do a similar study on a less deadly virus. In this case, only 0.001% of the young individuals died of this infection. Similarly, only 0.01% of the old individuals died. The relative risk is here 10, which might sound a bit scary if you are an old person, because you are then 10 times more likely to die of the infection. However, only 1 out of 10,000 old individuals died, which means that the risk of dying is very low. A relative risk of 10 does not have to be scary if the risk of dying is very low, because even if the risk increases from 0.001% to 
the risk of dying is still very low. This was the end of this video about the relative risk. In the next video, we'll have a look at the odds ratio. Thanks for watching.